Hi, my friends. Welcome to Inside the Minds of Authors. I'm DC Gomez, your host and also an indie author. I'm thrilled you're joining me today for another fun interview with a passionate author. We're going to kick off this show with an exciting reading, so let's get started. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Douglas Pennick. My book of sort of essays, The Age of Waiting, is going to come out on December 5th. Basically, I got started writing this because we are all facing some sense of the world ending, and we need to find some way to find new imagination in ourselves. And rather than saying what I think anybody else ought to think, I made something that has is more like walking through a garden or something where you look around and things suggest themselves to you. But I deeply hope that what people will come up with from reading this will be something I have no idea what it is. This begins with an essay called A World Ever at Its End. I look out the window at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Recent floods have scarred their flanks. Deep pine forests that once cascaded luxuriantly over the crests are thinning out. Now, patches of pine trees attacked by the mountain pine beetle die and turn a strangely violent rust color. As if burned, they become black and ashy. The forest silhouette running from peak to peak is no longer soft and verdant. Spikes of skeletal trunks and branches scratch at the sky. It's a sign. The world we know is moving to its end. The warmer weather, scientists say. The diminished periods of deep cold. More larvae of pine beetles now survive. And now, if we drive deeper into the mountains, we pass through vast swaths of dead forest, brittle, gray, black almost indistinguishable from the acres and acres decimated by summer forest fires that are continuing now and that still light up the night skies. I cannot bear to drive up there now. These are the echoes of what we see on television and read in the papers, melting polar caps, sea glaciers breaking apart, mountain glaciers shrinking, the expanding deserts, the ferocious territorial wars, people covered in hazmat suits helping those stricken with new diseases, streams of desperate migrants by the millions. Scientists predict worse. The civilization we inhabit is beginning to break up. We have all heard this. Assumptions and certainties are caving in. The feeling of being slowly swallowed, anesthetized, we cannot think how to resist. We watched horrified and spellbound. Then I put in a poem here by Osip Mandelstam, who was killed in the Stalin's concentration camps. And he wrote this in 1923. He sensed this coming on. In his case, it was a more political situation. Coal prickles my scalp. It's forbidden to speak out. Time cuts me off as your heel grinds me down. Life turns against life. Sounds slowly break up. Things drop out of sight past remembering in no time. Oh, yes, it once was better. Please, you can't compare. Oh, my blood, what stirred you then? Oh, blood, what stirs you now? Plainly, there's some design now playing on these lips. Winds are playing in the treetops, doomed to be cut down. So then uh, we move along to something a little more general. Stories from innumerable human cultures tell of a moment when the presiding deity, wearied of the greedy, self-centered dealings of men and women, of the corruption they have inflicted on society and the world, the deity, whoever she or he might be, then sent a great flood to purify the earth. Rains descended, rivers and lakes overflowed, oceans and seas covered the land. Humanity, with all its spoiled and ungrateful megalomania, was washed away. And 
though humanity has repeatedly returned, whether from flood or drought, from fire or war or plague, it is always again fallen. Now, the landscape of our passage on the earth is a diorama of ruins of great cities, strange funerary monuments, half forgotten philosophies, outlines of gardens, broken amphitheaters, nameless corpses, ruined palaces, fragmentary poetry, lyrics without music, spiritual paths without practitioners, libraries without books. Our time on earth is recorded in what remains of histories and innumerable epics where kings, heroes, and warrior queens lead their people into battle, fight to conquer or resist conquest, enslave or become enslaved, destroy worlds and see worlds destroyed. In Hindu and Buddhist traditions, it is maintained that existence moves continuously through cycles of increase and decrease, expansion and contraction waxing and waning. These cycles are divided into eras called the four yugas. The first, the Satya Yuga, is the longest and most ideal, a time of inner and outer beauty, purity, and perfection. Desires and their fulfillment arise simultaneously. It is said to last 1,728,000 years. The next is the Treta Yuga of 1,296,000 years. In this era, perfection begins to wane slightly. Longings, paths, and goals begin to unravel. In the following Dvevaputra Yuga that lasts 864,000 years, desires, intentions, actions, and social classes become more distinct and varied. Finally, here is our era, the shortest. The Kali Yuga, a time of destruction lasting 432,000 years. Now, in the Kali Yuga, desire and the objects of desire have separated. We struggle to join them, but the results are temporary. Even our cravings themselves are momentary, marked by anguish, longing, and rage. Spiritual, moral, and ethical life degenerates. Material advantage becomes our only value. Pollution, corruption, disease, degeneration, and violence fill our minds, poisoning the world. The only virtue that can still be practiced is compassion. We are moving into the end of time. All will end before another cycle begins. And indeed, we do feel the end approaching. The tempo of mass destruction has increased. The last century saw unparalleled slaughter destruction, and dislocation. It saw two world wars, internal slaughters in China, Russia, Cambodia, Uganda, the atom bomb, the Holocaust, and innumerable episodes of mass violence. Dread and unreality now pervade the mind stream of the age. The Zen teacher, Shunryu Roshi, endured the destruction and rebirth of his homeland, Japan. He once instructed his meditation students in this way. Don't move. Just die over and over. Don't anticipate. Nothing can save you now because you have only this moment. Not even enlightenment will help you now because there are no other moments. With no future, be true to yourself and express yourself fully. Don't move. Just die over and over. Is a little poem and then a little description of a scene. Do you think this moment is forever gone? Or was it just an echo of a different time and place? Briefly, do you remember dream walking down a corridor? When was that? Where? Briefly, do you see an old man, silver hair, dancing across the stage? Elegant, ardent determined. Briefly, a woman cries, her face crumples. Briefly, on a cold winter day, the smell of early spring, pink-tinged silver clouds, the dawn and love. Briefly, do you know if a painter will pick up a brush? Paralyzing August heat, the whole city is sweating. Pedestrians avoid the sides of the street with direct sunlight. I'm in the shadow of an awning, drinking iced tea. 
Across the street, in the glaring heat, an old white man in rags, drunk, rummages in a trash bin, looks up, stares at me, furious, insane. Hey, man, even from the other side of the street, it's as if he's seeing something in me I don't want to know about. Yes, you, screw you. Now what are you going to do, huh? It's over, finished. What are you going to do? I want to look at something else, but can't. The old man gives me a demented, toothless leer. He reaches down into the trash, and his hand comes out filled with some lumpy white semi-liquid that might be yogurt. It drips between his blackened fingers as he stuffs it in his mouth, watching me all the while. The white goo runs out of the corners of his mouth. His grin turns again to fury. Don't look away. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Inside the Minds of Authors. Today, we have the amazing Mr. Doxla Pinnock, and he has a very special treat for us today. So I'm so excited. Hello, Mr. Douglas. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. It has been a pleasure, and I'm so happy you have joined us. We're going to get right into this because I have tons of questions for you. So the first one is, tell us a little bit about where this book came from. How did you decide to put it all together? Actually, it came from a meeting I had with the editors of Tricycle, which is the largest, least sectarian of all the Buddhist magazines. It was 2016, November 4th. It was the day after the election. They said, what do you want to do something about? I said, I would like to do something about the end of the world. And I wasn't really inspired by the election. That was just a sort of fortuitous. But there it was. And I uh, asked one of the editors, a wonderful person named Emma Varvalukas. I said, how do you and people of your generation relate to this situation of ecological catastrophe and feel of breakdown? And she said, despair and a lack of model. So I thought maybe we could find ways to investigate this that weren't just sort of scientific or, you know, the social scientist says this and the psychologist says this, but to present a kind of uh, sequence of little episodes and, and poetry sometimes, all different kinds of things where those things are in the cracks and we could begin to start looking into the cracks because I think we all know what everybody says, you know. I like the feel of your book. You said that they're essays oriented, so they feel so much more like poems. They feel like they have this essence of a poetry, of a story being told in this very whimsical, magical sort of way. Were you intending to bring that to light? Yes, that's great. I couldn't help but hope for more, really. It worked. Because when I think of essays, I think much more, like you said, scientific in nature. I think more structure for a very academic sort of way. But when you started reading, it had a, so much more of that spoken word kind of magic to it. It had more of the poetry and the essence of that feel that we have when we think of poems more than the essay. So I was very yeah. pleasantly surprised. Oh, good. I think in the things I've seen that you've written, you're also concerned with, you know, how do people find something in themselves that will enable them to go forward in unexpected difficulties? We have the kinds of difficulties we know about, but then there are these things that you have no idea why that would be happening. Like, for instance, here, I'm looking right out the window at the Rocky Mountains. There have been these enormous forest fires, and you can see them sometimes coming up over the edge and huge things of smoke, so you can't go out. What do you do? Plus, we the virus thing, what do you do? How do you make your life meaningful and worthwhile? So you have to figure out new things. I like the insight that you take. And I like the fact that a lot of them are very more open-ended. So yeah. you get to have people kind of put their own perspective in it and be able to have almost a question and answer dialogue to them. So when you were starting to come up with this book, what inspired you? You have a lot of things come into place, but where did you get your inspiration from? I have a long Buddhist training, which is not so much involved in how to get people to think like me or other people or to join in any kind of way of leading their lives. But it is a way of looking at your mind and seeing what pops up, even the things that are painful and not so nice and difficult, as well as things that you want, and not to choose between them exactly, but to look at the whole thing. 
And so I think it was that kind of training uh, which provided a background, a kind of canvas to say, well, we can have things that are awful and we can have things that are charming and we can have things that are spooky and all of it. And we have to actually, because we're now looking at a sort of uh, social and political setup when people decide definitely they don't want certain things around, can't bear it. I like the poem that you read because it talks so much about what meditation is all about. It's just being. Don't try yeah. to go there. Don't try to come here. Just be. And I think currently we live in a place where we feel that we have to do so much, that we always have to be moving, that we always have to be going. And staying still is such a different perspective. So that was a fun little take that you added in there. Oh, that's great. It's also, it's being forced upon us. We have moved from the age of more to the age of less. And we can't just go running around and let's go shopping or let's go out and do some kind of a usual thing. So we're sort of being forced right now to slow down. You live in your house. There you are. Well, it's interesting because I'm reminiscing. I'm old enough to know the age before technology was huge, where yeah. you spent a lot of time in your house. You played outside. You did all these things and how quickly that changed. And then we're going back to that. We're going back to kids being in their house and kids having to play with themselves because you can't go off and about and doing all these things. So it's kind of interesting how that circle just came around. Yes. In your book, do you have a favorite essay? Not really. There are ones I like for different reasons. I was very, very happy. There's an essay there about a Buryat, that's a sort of Mongolian Buddhist teacher who died in a concentration camp in the 60s. And his name was Bidya Dandaran. He was a genius in his way. And he worked while he was in concentration camps, which was most of his life, on how to teach Buddhism, in this case, in a way that was strictly applicable to being in that situation. So he just gave himself completely to the situation he was in. And he was beaten and he was sick a lot, but that's what he did. And he had students, some of them still existing from Latvia, actually, because they were in the concentration camp with him. I read about him. I was in a store. I picked up a book and there was a little essay about him in 1977. And I thought, oh, my heavens, what an extraordinary person. And I always wanted to write something about him or to, to actually just have his name, do something to make his name and his great effort. And this also fit in with the idea of model that I had started the bunch of essays with. Because in one way, he didn't succeed. He didn't get free. He didn't get recognized. It wasn't all great. But he did it. He lived a life of complete generosity and courage and consistency. So I was very happy when I had the opportunity to write another essay about him, just to have his name continue maybe just a little longer. That meant a lot to me. It's an amazing way to immortalize a person who had given so much to include his life or something that he was passionate about. Congratulations, that is beautiful. Yeah. When you wrote this book, did you have a target audience in mind? Who were you looking to connect with? I have always felt that actually to write a book is to try and find the people that want to connect with the book. I don't actually know. So whenever that you know you have the publisher's questionnaire about who's your target audience, I really have to scramble, make up stuff. Because it's to find out who's out there. How can we meet? It's like we would never have met at all. Maybe even know each other, about each other. But so then in that sense, the book is a success because we met. I like how you look at that. That is very exciting. Do you have a genre for this book? I suppose kind of literary essays, which sounds really, that's about as depressing as it gets. But, <laughs> you know, if you say this, oh, I've written a book of literary essays, they don't say, oh, golly, I really want to run out there and read that. <laughs> I try to avoid saying stuff. <laughs> it has some very clinical terms to it. It's a little clinical right. feel. I think that's what it is. Can, what do you think? Do you have a better idea? I'd love it. I'm trying to think because you have such a wide variety of different poems and essays put together. So it's interesting just to kind of feel with it's very fictional in nature, but it's very more, I don't know, I have to think about it. But literary essays, I agree with you, is very clinical. 
<laughs> it doesn't give you the feel of what the book is all about, but it's such an interpretation of our current culture and humanity as a whole that yeah. has such a social like undertaking. So we might have to think about this one. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't help the cause. Do you have a message you would like your readers to get out of this book? Not so much. Not in the sense, you know, haste makes waste or stitch in time saves nine. But I think more a feeling, a feeling of you could just look around more. And it's supposed to make that happen rather than to tell people to do it. It's a way to inspire them to see the world a little differently without having to. A little more, yeah. Look in the cracks. I like how you say it. Look in the cracks. It's a really fun way of looking at it. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions, a little bit more about you and your writing journey and less about the book. So we're going to switch gears a little bit. Sure. When did you start writing? Probably when I was about 30. I think if I could have been a classical musician, that's what I would have preferred. But so instead, I had a fool with the keyboard on the typewriter and then computer. <laughs> what other books have you written? Uh, I've done a bunch of short stories, but then a friend of mine had a commission to write an opera in Germany. It was a one-act opera. I said, sure. And it was supposed to be about Gesar of Ling, who was a Tibetan and actually all of Central Asian epic hero. And he's a sort of spiritual Terminator too. I wasn't too interested in him. But I started to write it and I saw how you could find things in there that I hadn't expected. I did this libretto for him, and I had no idea what I was doing. And this was before internet. This is 1992. So everything was fax and phone, which was really stupid. I went to Germany where I'd never been, and I couldn't speak German, and I didn't know what was happening. I'd never heard the music. Munich still, but at that time particularly because they had more money, they have like four symphony orchestras. It's a very serious music town, wonderful facilities and all of that. I went and there was uh, eight people, uh, 10 people playing, a wonderful speaker named Omar Ebrahim, but there was also Peter Serkin and the pianist and Emmanuel Axe and Yo-Yo Ma. So it was pretty major. And there was my wife playing the clarinet or my wife-to-be. We liked each other. She was an American. It still is. Uh, <laughs> we liked each other, but I was getting divorced. She was getting married. You know, it's like, uh-uh. And we only got together 10 years ago. So that was that kind of thing. Sony recorded it. The premiere, the president of Germany came. I mean, it was sort of over the top. So that started me doing Gesar. So I did three Gesar books with a grant from the Witter Binner Foundation. Basically, I wrote Tibetan epics. Somehow I could do that. I don't know why. I couldn't do it again, but I could do it then. That is incredible. It is amazing how you took your love for music and your writing and merged them into this really amazing adventure you had that just kind of happened. Yeah. So then I wrote a bunch of other novels and things, and one about the Third Ming Dynasty Emperor. And that was an interesting one because I didn't want it to be sort of like white folks in drag. The more I studied about China, it was another world. I mean, deeply. Absolutely. For, yeah, because just to start, all their ideals are in the past. So it's in the Zhao dynasty. So to be great is to emulate the past. It's not this thing about we have to the Oedipal deal with daddy and start a new future. You have to be in the past. So they have a completely different take on direction of things. And on and on and on. They've thought about all the same things we do because they're people, but completely different take. It was almost like writing science fiction. That is huge. How much research are you doing? And where did you start to do your research from? It took 10 years. Ooh, I, I um, can see that. <laughs> yeah. And I was very, very lucky. I had a, a friend who was a professor, also a wonderful translator named Kidder Smith. I'd known him forever. I would say, what about this? Why that? Like, how come the Chinese don't have an epic poem? They don't. They just don't. He would say, well, go look there. Or you might think this. Or take a look there. He would point me in all kinds of directions to where I would then proceed to get lost. Well, that's the only way we find out things, no? That's the fun thing about research. You start one place and you just kind of go down that yeah. rabbit hole and just have a blast. Do you do a lot of research? I do. I do a lot of alternative history in my books. Oh, yes. So of course. 
So I tend to go down those rabbit holes. I'm infatuated with the Dark Ages as well as Egyptian mythology. Well, it's wonderful because you find such absolutely strange, strange, strange things. And it's beautiful. I was very lucky with that book. I had this giant pile of stuff. I didn't know how to organize it. I really didn't. I mean, I could have the emperor do the thing, but somehow that wasn't so good because it's a point of view we can't comprehend. There was some accident. Someone gave me a ticket. I ended up in Beijing, and I went to the Forbidden City twice. And the second time I went, it was this yellow fog, dusty. It's a very famous weather because it's the sand of the desert coming in, being blown around. So there weren't quite so many people. Of course, there are huge numbers of Chinese people because it's that's their place. So I was there, and I was in a, one of the long walkways because it, there's no horizons. It's all walls. I all of a sudden sensed, and I almost never do this. I thought, this place is haunted. I'm pretty sure it is. (laughs) Oh, it was haunted. And I thought, oh, but it's not haunted by kings and ministers and powerful people. It's haunted by servants. Ooh, that's a little bit more scary. (laughs) Yeah, because they can find nothing of that scale and imagination to serve anymore. Oh, wow. That's really deep. Yeah. So there they were. And so then I made the narrator of this book a eunuch who was a scribe for the emperor. And eunuchs at that time were not particularly just harem attendants. All the greatest generals of the time were eunuchs. The greatest admiral ever in Chinese history was a eunuch. All the diplomats were eunuchs. Because it wasn't so much a gender or sexual issue. It was a family and loyalty issue. So as a eunuch, you had no more family. Boom, finished. That is so dramatic and tragic all at once. Like, oh, that's a good way to cut all ties. Okay. But then some people understood that in the general scheme of things, they had a very fortunate life because they were way higher up on the flagpole than anybody else. I mean, but it was always risky. Everything was risky. The emperor could be undone. And so it was spooky. But so I made this guy, you know, that was my guy. He didn't have normal interests. He was a servant. He was a high level servant. That's a very unique and kind of fun perspective to take, especially when you're thinking of such a huge dynasty that you're trying to tackle, to look at it from the outside of like somebody who doesn't have all that stuff. Right. Amazing. Oh, that's really exciting. So tell us. I'm sure you come across things like this and do them. Well, I always want to say that I like the underdog perspective. I like the different perspective of looking at things and how you can have some fun with them and just kind of explore those paths. Well, yes, I can completely relate with you. Tell us, Mr. Douglas, in your many years in this journey in the writing world, what has been one lesson that you have learned? Persistence. (laughs) I didn't want to learn that lesson at all. (laughs) Someone said to my father, Oh, you're such a patient man. He looked at them with his grim little smile and he said, it's not because I want to be. (laughs) And so persistence is the same. I mean, we just have to keep going. If you're writing kind of to prove your existence or to kind of justify something about yourself, that's very problematic. But if there are things that are larger in scale, then I think that will give you a certain amount of persistence. Because you think, well, really, this should be in the world. This might help out. Persistence, I usually joke with people. I tell them that's my superpower. I might not be very good at many things, but I can definitely persist on many things. Well, I'm very impressed at the way you've really created so many things for yourself. I mean, using the kinds of technology and publishing stuff that's available, that you've really made a whole universe for yourself in which people can find you. Somebody explaining it to creating as an author, especially an indie author, is all about creating what we call the Disney experience. Is how do you give your readers the best of everything and kind of bring them into this universe that they can call their own? I'm a true believer the moment I write something is no longer mine. It becomes the readers and it's their path to whatever they want. My job is just to make it as exciting as I can. So I try to give them as much as I can in different venues and still have a blast doing it. So thank you. I have a blast. I love love what I do and I get to do many different things in different areas. So yes, I'm having a great time. Oh, that's great. And, and I think it shows. I mean, that, that kind of thing is infectious. The sense of infectious. 
tell everybody one of the things I've really loved to do is this podcast. Because mm-hmm. every time I leave, I get more inspired than anybody else just because I get to talk to passionate writers like yourself who love what they yeah. do and continue to do it. I'm like, this is makes everything amazing. Well, yeah. And it's a sort of interesting time in that basically the large scale publishing is very involved. It's very bureaucratic business bureaucracy. So it's not particularly imaginative or brave. And if you don't fit in their categories, you have a problem. And you do. I mean, I've I've had the problem. And it's been explained to me. On the other hand, you can publish your own work easily. You can find people you never knew existed more easily than ever before. I think if you look at it as a personal thing, rather than a business hustle, some creepy ambition, we meet tons of people. And it's fantastic. And you come together with people that you would never, never, never have met. And sometimes what you do is helpful to them or a little inspiring or something. And that's great. And so the scale doesn't matter so much, so long as you can do it and get, make some kind of living either through the writing itself or through other things. I highly recommend everybody who wants to write a book to do it and just to enjoy that process. Yeah. Just because everybody should really try to put their vision, their story, or even their life story into paper. I think it's an amazing journey. It doesn't mean you have to publish it, but I think just the writing process as a whole can be very therapeutic for some people. So I highly recommend it. But yes, with technology, it is amazing how much we all have connected and how big our village has become. Yes. So Mr. Douglas, tell us, what are you working on now? I have an old book that I worked on for about 10 years that's basically... 7th century, he was the prince regent, Shotoku Taishi, and he is a great culture figure. He made the Buddhism a state religion of Japan. Confucianism became governmental norm. He started no drama. He's sort of, when Japanese people want to authenticate their own culture, they go to him. So they'll say, oh, Shotoku Taishi. So he's like this little seed of culture. So I thought to talk about him at a time when the seed of culture is mainly commercial, might be a good thing to do. I'll bring that up probably myself, but I don't know if somebody else might might like to do it. But either way, so there's that. And then all of a sudden, I I don't know why I did this. It's a, (laughs) I'm working on a bunch of short stories. It's actually an Indian collection, one of the oldest collections from India of stories. And they're all kind of awful. And they all end in the middle it's a completely weird thing. But to me, it's, it's like the dark basement of the house, maybe. We are always telling stories, and the stories are endless, and the stories are what we hear other people's stories, and it makes stories of, of the world. And this is like some part of that, of the beginning of that. I'm having kind of a nice time with that. Also because it's really rewriting. Somebody tells you a story, and you tell the story. It's all like that. So I don't have to work too hard to make up stuff. (laughs) You have a nice foundation to go with it. So that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Where can our listeners find you? Where do we get a hold of your works? Where do you locate it? Tell us that. Uh, You can go on Amazon and find me. I have a little website, douglaspanic.com. Facebook has been very helpful in the sense that I don't use it at all personally. You know, I don't um, talk about what I cooked for dinner or how I'm not feeling so hot. But I use it more as a kind of magazine. I started out with it because I wanted to sort of find a way to let people know about books I had written. But then I quickly realized that I would become a true bore, that it would be like the insurance salesman at the cocktail party, that you know what he's going to say to you. Every time... It, my name would pop up, they think, oh, golly, he's hustling stuff again. What I'm writing reflects also a lot of interests and what other people are writing or performing or playing or all those things. So it's, it's a world I wanted to share with people. And I just do that. So it just has all kinds of weird stuff. I like puppet shows. My wife and I, she speaks Hungarian. We translate for a Hungarian puppet magazine. So we got into puppetry. I mean, we don't do it. You have such a fascinating and diverse background. Every time you mention something, I was like, 
You do puppets. That is amazing. I wish I did puppets. I just like them. I wish I knew how to do it. I'm surprised you haven't researched that and figured out how to do it. Well, I'm shy. <laughs> <laughs> you are a writer. I'm not surprised about that. Most of us have those tendencies. So that will be right in par with the rest of us. Yeah. I do like what you have done with your Facebook page. And it doesn't have to be personal in the nature that most people think about it. Personalize it towards your business and your business is writing. So you have a collection of things that people preferably will enjoy. So I appreciate it. I enjoy what you're doing with it. Oh, thank you very much. I like well, the take. Mm-hmm. It has been an awesome experience learning about your works and everything you have going on. Now we're going to wrap up with something a little fun, a little easy. We're going to our lightning round. So these are fun, easy, quick questions. Don't think too much about them. Whatever pops into your head and we'll go from there. Are you ready? Speed dating. Pretty much. In question forms. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Oh, nice. Tea or coffee? Both. Really? Yeah. Okay. Scary movie or comedy? Neither. Do you do movies or do you have a preference? I like thrillers. I like mysteries, murder mysteries. Okay. I'm very happy if somebody gets killed right at the beginning. Boom. <laughs> you have to fool around and wait to find out who's dead. I'm not so interested. <laughs> Just get to the chase. Make it happen yeah, and then we'll figure out who did it. Right. I like, I like. Sweet or sour? Sweet. Okay. But I like sour too, but sweet. Okay. You prefer sweet, but you will do sour. If you had any superpower, what would it be? Save the world. You would save the world with what superpower? You still didn't answer the question. Okay, I think it's a, a kindness, compassion. Oh, I like that. Well, I mean, compassion really is putting others before yourself. And we become weaker. We feel weaker even when we're thinking, oh, but I'm not going to get that cookie. As soon as we start that kind of contracted, me and mine, we are in a painful situation and not a very useful one. So here's your last one. If you could meet any famous person, dead or alive, or any historical person, dead or alive, who would you like to meet? Mm, Vyasha. Vyasha is the writer of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is, I think, the greatest single piece of writing in the world, ever. It's gigantic. It has everything in it. It's one of the most amazing, and it's still alive. I mean, people throughout Southeast Asia, but India, and then going all the theater things, everything comes from that. Or some of the characters have become deities. Actually, there are temples to them, and people practicing devotion to them. He also supposedly also wrote the Bhagavata Purana, which is a really long, long text. It's supposed to be the actually only text will give you a way to be in this Kali Yuga, in this end of time of degeneration. It's gigantic. It's an encyclopedia. He supposedly wrote that. So I would like to see what somebody who could do such a thing looked like. I wouldn't mind if I just watched him walk down the street, you know, because it would be like, how did you? How did you have your mind be so huge and so generous? That is absolutely powerful and beautiful. Exciting. Mr. Douglas, it has been a pleasure having you with us today. Do you have any closing remarks before we leave? Thank you very, very much. Come to Boulder, come for dinner. I've been cooking for years. I can. It won't be too terrible. Come for dinner. I need to make a trip to the Rocky Mountains. That sounds beautiful. It's like, ooh. Okie doke. Thank you so much and for all you do and uh, for having me. I really appreciate it so much. Absolutely a pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, give this podcast a like, share it with your friends, tell somebody, help us grow the community together. And thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next week for another exciting episode. Bye, everyone. Thank you.